to buy it or check it out. And this is very simple and, and with no cost. Just ride by the house occasionally, ride by on a rainy day and see if the street is flooded. Um, ride by on a Saturday and see if all the kids are hanging out in the lot next to it. You're going to have kids playing ball there, maybe a lot of noise. Maybe your neighbor next door is the local president of the Hells Angels chapter and members come to their house. Uh, it gives you a little more insight into what goes on and um, just the way the world would see your house and what it's going to be like when you're in there. If it's right. Try be it out. Check quiet. it out at different times of day and also try out the commute. You yeah, know, exactly. You don't, want, you don't want surprises. So you want to do your due diligence. And this is stuff you have to do. And, and I think you mentioned speak to neighbors. And you can also Google the, the neighborhood in the area. Look up old news stories. Are there environmental issues nearby? Are there tax increases proposed? Or you know what changes might be coming to the neighborhood? And the neighbors will often tell you very easily, you know, uh, just what's going on. Oh, we're sorry to see Joe and Mary leave. But they might also say to you that house has been nothing but problems. They just had a fire. And now you have key information, and it costs you nothing but a few minutes of your time. Now, there are going to be some other parties involved in the real estate matter besides the buyer and the seller and their attorneys. What tips do you have for the person who's going to be the – what a company is going to be the lender to – succeed in a real estate transaction and prevent problems? One Again, uh, almost what we've been saying about the attorney, do things early. If you're looking to purchase a house, start looking around for lenders before you even get close to finding that house. Um, you'll get a form from them. It's a standard form, and you're going to fill it out. And it's information, you know, where do you live, what's your name, what's your social security number. Uh, then they'll ask you a checking account number. And for some people, that's very easy. For other people, they're not as well organized. But it's nothing there is hard. But you'll have it all ready, and you'll get a pre-approval. Uh, what I would advise anyone, go to a couple of different lenders. It's always um, better when you have a little competition. You might assume everybody's charging 3.5%, and you get 32 And so long as that's legitimate, and you can ask your attorney, say, this group, could they be that different? And if, if he or she feels and knows the market and says, yes, they charge less because they're a local bank or something, that's great. You can save significant money. And also, you'll see the way some groups do business. Some are very accurate. Some just don't even call you back. Well, if they don't call you back at the beginning when they want a new customer or client, they're probably not going to call you at the end. So you want to see how they respond to people. And there also may be different types of mortgages. There may be special types of mortgages you qualify for that may save you a free buck. So your attorney can help you out with that. Your broker may, be, have, may also be able to give you information as well. It's an, an important to investigate all your options. Many banks today have a specific mortgage department, and why that's good or why I think it's good, the people who work there are professionals. They know very well what they're doing rather than someone who does it among other banking transactions. And they can tell you, hey, you won't qualify for this mortgage, but you'll fit in here, or if you can come up with $2,000 more, I could get you this rate here. And that's going to make your world and life a lot easier. And they're going to be happy, too. So you're going to have a win-win. And that's another issue. You should speak to the attorney for the buyer and the lender, too. And the buyer should find out how much other money they need for the down payment, for closing costs, for insurance payments, for well, other things. Oh, definitely. And lenders are usually pretty good in brokers. They'll usually figure that out for you and go through it. But I would always say allow that even that number is going to change by maybe 2 to 5 percent, not to scare people, but just other things may come up. There may be um, uh, if you're get, getting an inspection, you're going to pay for that. It's well worth it, but you're going to pay for it. Uh, there may be some cost that comes up that you didn't expect or even when you get into the house. So just allow that there's a little cushion there. You don't want to cut things down so that you can't afford a Happy Meal after you buy that house. Now, there could be other parties involved in the real estate transaction. They could be a home inspector. They could be a, a title company, uh, perhaps someone conducting some kind of test. What other tips do you have for the the buyer or those people performing those services in order to uh, pr provide a smooth real estate transaction? Well, a good inspector can be invaluable, and usually your attorney knows someone they deal with, or the broker will have someone, but I ch choose just to go with the attorney. They seem to have more names, and they're more neutral to the situation. You get a good inspector who says, it's a very nice house, but here's the weak spots. Now, I tell people, we all have weak spots. Uh, the prettiest woman, the handsomest man may have bad teeth, bad feet, a bum knee. That doesn't mean it's bad, but you should be aware of it. 
And this may be something that you could negotiate about if it's a serious problem, cracks in the cement. Well, maybe you didn't want cracks in the cement or maybe you have someone who is disabled and that's a real problem for you might be able to work out a deal with them where there's a slight variation in the price to allow for that because you're going to have to fix it up. Uh, A good inspector will tell you the roof probably has two more years to go. Well, that's okay. Nothing bad about that. But Bad in the sense that so long as you know it, you may have to pay $7,000 in two years. If that doesn't bother you and you really like the house and everything else is absolutely perfect, that's fine. But maybe a seller will give you a little concession for that because the roof is going to go at some time and uh, you might get in there six weeks and there might be a leak. So all of those things can be helpful to you. You mentioned the title company. The title company is usually handled by the buyer's attorney, but they're going to find out interesting legal matters about the property. If the property should be 40 by 100, is it really or is it 40 by 90? And maybe the owner or the neighbor in the back actually owns the back 10 feet of your property. That will happen after you're in contract, and unless there's something really unusual, that's when the title report is ordered and the title search. And you mentioned earlier, if you know, in, in terms of the home inspector giving advice, and the buyer wants to find out if it's a minor problem or a major problem, if it's a correctable problem, and the buyer, if they're concerned about lead or asbestos or, or they see something and they're concerned about it, they should let the home inspector know, and maybe they have to pay a little extra and have a, a more specific test for that item. And that's well worth it. Uh, you're being penny-wise and pound-foolish, especially on Long Island today, where almost every house is 400000 plus. Not to pay, and, and I'm going to take an average number, I think it's around five to six or $700 for an inspection, because if there's something wrong, you're going to pay 10 and 20 times that, and you're going to be stunned by You're going to be annoyed. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be fighting with people. And in the end, you're going to suffer because, you know, we never get that value back out of it after the... Uh, the dog is out of the cage, so to speak. And and again, the attorney should find out and if the buyer has a, a dream of expanding the house, expanding the kitchen, adding a room on, converting to solar energy, whatever it is they should ask before they sign and before they go ahead, if it's doable and what it will cost. And that magic word, before you sign, yes. Have all your questions. And the more you do, the more that's going to come up. First of all, people think much more of you if you're knowledgeable and ask a few questions. They're going to say, wait a minute, that Ken guy is smart. He knows this stuff. I better, you know, put my uh, fingers to the task and really do it. And just a general rule I would say to all consumers today, I found a lot of professionals, they're very busy today. They're trying to multitask. They may be texting while they're on the office phone with you. They're texting someone else. It's up to the person themselves to stay on top of the deal. If you're feeling, gee, the attorney hasn't been in touch with me in a week, call him. Get in touch with them. If they don't call you back, go to the office and just stand there. But sometimes an attorney can be busy, but you should be the most important client for your deal. You obviously are. And that's true for a broker or anyone else. Don't wait for them to get back to you. Be a little bit proactive. And if they're not getting back to you, that could be a red flag. So maybe that's a sign you better change the people who are helping you. Oh, absolutely. And that that red flag and the word proactive, I love that. Because for two or three months, you're buying this house. It's not too much to ask. And, And another little tip. Um, just get it. When you start this out, pick up one of those red wells designated as house file. Anything you get pertaining to the house, even if you're not a super organized person, just put in there. Uh, I had one person, they actually had a loose leaf book. Everything they did, they wrote on a different page. They, they cut out the listing of the house, pasted in there. It was very impressive. And it, when we went back, if I said to them, uh, when did you first see this house? Wait a minute. Let me check the date. And I was impressed because they really knew anything about the house. They had their organization, and it was very simple. And I just want to mention today there are different ways to communicate. So the consumer and their attorney and the broker should find out the way that works for them, whether it's phone or email or text or something else or faxes. Whatever it is, they should agree on a method, and they should you know stick to that method. I I agree with you, but one of the things I'll I'll say is great today, and this is coming from an older attorney, as you can see. Um, If it's an email, you have something in writing. And I once had this with a bank where they forgot they promised me something, and it was a difference of $750. And I said, here's your email, and it says you'll return this to me. Well, I got a $750 refund. Oh, no, it's good to confirm things in in writing. And, And also a caveat, if you're using email, I think it's good to send a response. 
okay, I'm working on it, or I'll look at it for, I got your email, and I'll get back to you about it. So it's very important not to just get an email and sit back, because people may not know if you got it, if you read it, if you understood it, if you're working on it. And as you know as an attorney, and I know the biggest complaint we hear about attorneys is that they don't get back to a client. Now, I actually know an attorney who feels that if they have no news, that equals bad news. So that's why they don't call back. They're nice people, but they just think that that's going to hurt the client's feelings, um, both for the attorneys and the people. You always want to answer and get back to the person. You don't want to be obsessive. You don't have to email every day. But if you get something, put the questions in the email. Ask them if you have questions. Ask and for an answer. And things like the status of the mortgage commitment, if someone needs more time on it, just keep people in the loop. What's going on? When the deadline's coming up? What's being done about it? And that's very important that you say that. Sometimes people are overwhelmed with the rate and they'll get a 30-day commitment. Well, you better speak with your attorney first. Can you close in 30 days? Maybe the contract, and I've had deals where the contract doesn't say that, and the seller says, I'm not ready. I'm sorry, you have a 30-day commitment, but I'm not moving out the And also, months. if there's an extension needed or a delay in applying for the mortgage, again, it's important that you follow up with all this, you do it in writing, and keep the clients in the loop. We just have a little bit more time, Bill. Any other tips you'd like to offer? Uh, very really, briefly. Very briefly is just work closely with your attorneys. And as you use the words, stay proactive. If you're on top of it, your attorney will be on top of it, the bank, the broker, everybody, and you'll have a good closing. We just want to remind everyone, whatever you've heard has been offered as information only. You should get legal advice from your own attorney. And you've heard, you've received a lot of tips from Bill Horan and how to select and, and use an attorney. For lawyers listening to the show for CLE credit, the code is DELTA55. That's D E L T A 55. And you can apply for credit. There might be an administrative charge through the Nassau Academy of Law. You're listening to Law You Should Know here on 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nass Community College in Garden City, Long Island, New York. You can join us next week at this same time for another program as part of our real estate series on Law You Should Know. And we're also over the Internet at ncc.edu slash WHPC.